Very good. Welcome. This is Wednesday, April 14, our elementary statistics class at Delta College. And today we're going to be continuing our discussion of linear regression and learning some more details about linear regression. Last time we casually referred to those as trivia facts. I, I don't want to trivialize them by calling them trivia, but all the things that we can learn from what calculating device, computer, tells us about the relationship between two sets of data displayed in a scatter plot. So we were actually looking at this problem 59 last time, partially. We're gonna finish discussing that and then we'll discuss another problem in the book, it's number 68. And that will give you uh, really good ideas of what you're doing on your current homework problems. Your current homework is homework 11. And homework 11 is the last written homework of the semester. So we are rapidly coming to the end of the semester. That is our last written homework. Now, after you prepare that and submit it next Tuesday, then you can work on finishing up any Newton Alta assignments you have to finish up and just reviewing problems for the exam. Three which we'll talk about more next week. Remember, this is week 14. Week 15, we're gonna do one more topic, one more set of topics. And then in the final week of the semester, we'll just review and take your exam the same way we reviewed and take exam for exam one and exam two. So same procedure. I don't know, again, I mentioned this possibly last time. I don't know about the deadlines for exam three I'm gonna to have to look at that carefully. That's why I'll wait to report that to you until next week because I have to hand in grades quickly after the semester is over. Now to recap on your exam two, exam two is graded and returned with your current grade reports in your Google Drive folders. So you can review that and exam two solutions are posted. So, uh, definitely look over your exam too, look over the solutions. If you have any questions at all about the exam, the answers, the scoring, I don't mind at all. If you have a question, you'd like to ask something, why did you score this? Why did you score that? But before you do that, at least please look at the solutions so you know one way the problems could have been done. You know, if you have a question about how this should be or how that should be, at least you have an example in the posted solutions about how the problem could be done. But don't hesitate at all if you'd like to ask a question. Okay, then we're gonna jump right in to our picking up our discussion so we can try to get the most possible out of today. You know, all these problems that we're doing, they're not one line problems or two line problems. They require a lot of consideration. So we were looking at this book, problem number 59 from section 12.2 last time. And this represented Cuba's, oh, product purchasing power, uh, purchasing power parity. Okay. And that must be some term in economics that measures the strength, the problem said, of a country's currency. You know, how strong is the dollar? How strong is the euro? How strong is the, uh, used to be the franc or the Deutschmark, but now it's the euro. How strong is Cuba's unit of monetary script? I do not know what Cuba's money is called, like euro and dollar and Deutschmark and franc. So what we did is took the information in that table in problem 59 and we adjusted it slightly 
The reason why we adjusted it was to make it easier to graph and easier to calculate with numbers. But you don't have to adjust them. You could simply use the years here, the table listed years, 1999, 2000, 2002, et cetera. And then it listed Cuba's purchasing power parity as 17,000 or 1700, 1700, 2300. Here, I just made those numbers easier to mark and read, if you remember what we talked about. So this column X represented years since 1998. Anytime you're just trying to begin examining something and you wanna make a nice graph of it with a center at the origin or a starting place, you can always declare a starting place. 1998, okay, then years since 1998 means 1999, 2000, 2002, et cetera. The Y column represented this economics term that I'm not excellent on, Cuba's purchasing power parity. Now, purchasing power leaks, how much can you get for a dollar? You know, like what's a loaf of bread cost? What's a gallon of milk cost? Parity is when you compare something. I mean, the word comparison and parity come from the place. Parity means trying to equate two things in a way, although I don't know exactly what the Webster dictionary definition is, but you can look that up. So it's something about the strength of Cuba's currency. So let's examine all these points, we've plotted them already as we plotted them last time. Let's mark and label the graph very carefully. So this is a good thing for you to do in any graphs that you create. Not only mark the scale, uh, scale consistently and evenly, but then give your reader some meaning of the scale. Like this is five years since 1998, 10 years since 1998, 15 years since 1998. This is the horizontal axis or the independent variable. And then on the vertical axis, the dependent variable Y is Cuban purchasing power parity. And here we marked it in thousands of dollars. 1.7 meant $1.7,000, which is $1,700. But again, here the scale is marked consistently from the beginning point every so often. I don't need to write one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I can just make my marks consistent and even and then say at the fifth one, here's the fifth one, here's the tenth one. This makes graph very readable. Let me slide the paper up so you can see what I wrote on the horizontal axis. Okay. So if someone is reading this graph right here, they have a very good idea of what you're saying. They know exactly what each of these dots means. Now, I have labeled the center of this graph to be X mean and Y mean, and X bar and Y bar, the mean value of X, the mean value of Y, are literally adding up these records of X. If you added up all these numbers here for X, you'd get 75. And then dividing by how many numbers I have, 75 divided by 11. I'll show you that exactly in a second. But there are 11 records, they add up to 75. So the mean here is 6.8. Approximately, let's say 6.82. You always have this issue of where to round off. But if we're talking about years, then to say 6.8 years or 6.82 years is not too excessive. Likewise, we add up all the Ys, which have uh, funnier decimals places to them. I can't do that quickly in my head, but all the Ys added up to 59.2, according to my calculation, divide by 11. 
and you'll get y mean, which is 5.38. And then we have this line of best fit called Y hat. That's kind of like a little upside down V that I wrote on top of there. It has a certain intercept and a certain slope. The intercept is A and the slope is B. And we're going to calculate the A and B and the calculator is also going to calculate the A and B. But to save time, I took us to where we about left off last time. And that is here is the line of best fit. Clearly these points don't line up. In fact, they take a big jump at nine years after 1998, at 2007, apparently they take a large jump. We talked about why this could have been possibly last time. But if I forced you to draw a line, to fit these points best, this is the line we would draw. I took this from the calculator and then copied it to my paper. I'll show you how I did that in a second. And we talked last time about what it means to be the line of best fit, that each one of these points, well, none of these points, just about none of these points are on this line. They're all slightly off the line. And how far off the line is called the residual. That's the distance between the point and this best fitting line. And the residuals measure the distance from the point to the line. We can talk about how this line fits best because it minimizes the squares of these residuals. These residuals were called the epsilon values epsilon one, epsilon two, epsilon three, four, five. This is epsilon five that I just drew right here. And I could imagine drawing a little square with that residual. And that tells me, let me see if I can squeeze that in a little better, but writing smaller is not gonna necessarily help us. And I'll see if I can fit that in better or maybe take it out here to the side so I could write larger. That's a good trick to use when you want to label something, but you can't fit it in nicely. You could just draw a little wiggle over to the side and then label it. Okay, when you draw squares made out of the links of these lines, then this best line is promised to be the line that has the least square area, when you total all the squares, the least area of the squares. And so that's called the least squares regression line. I, trying to crowd or pack everything I can into this drawing. And probably at some point, it's gonna be a failure, but let's, see how far we can get. Okay, so this is where we were last time. And now I want to pick up by telling you how I get that least squares regression line. And then we're going to move on to what's called the correlation coefficient. And we're going to do a hypothesis test on the correlation coefficient to see how well that line fits that data. Now, before I do that, and I'm also going to do this on the formula sheet that we post on our website. I want to remember that there's a distinction between me doing the calculations by hand and the calculator doing the calculations for me. Even for 11 points right here, it's getting unreasonable for me to do these calculations with my bare hands because I'll just have to write in a lot of details. But I do want to remind you that I'm always able to make all the calculations that I'm using this picture by hand or with the aid of a calculator or a computer, Excel spreadsheet, whatever you are most comfortable with. I don't mind when you do that on certain problems as long as you show me the work that you did 
to reach your answers. But I want to do, in some sense, I want to do a brief review of some of those formulas. And he presents, or she presents, the author presents these formulas in her textbook, even before she shows you how to use them on the calculator. So I want to give you kind of a big picture right here. And it even starts from the beginning of our class. The fact that in this column, I have n equals 11 values. The fact that these numbers add up to 75. And I did not write that very neatly. The sum of all the x numbers add up to 75. The fact that the sum of all the y numbers add up to 59.2. These are all facts about the data. The fact that the mean for x is the sum of all the x numbers over n. The fact that the mean for y is the sum of all the y numbers over n. And then when we go deeper, we can talk about standard deviation. We can talk about the regression line. Every time I bring you a new formula, like the standard deviation for X or the standard deviation for Y, I can express that in terms of this data. The standard deviation for X, I could write as the summation of each square of x minus the summation of all the x's squared divided by n. Take that difference, divide by n minus 1, and take the square root. That is the sample standard deviation of the x's. Now, because I don't have time to square each x, well, a reasonable amount of time, let's write down squaring each x. 1, 4, 16, 25, 36, 49. Well, yes, we could certainly do it, but it costs some time, and we'd rather be discussing the problem. And then I could add up 75 and square it. Yes, we're all capable of squaring 75 and dividing by 11. Okay, decimals. Then dividing by n minus 1. You know, all these calculations can be done on a calculator, even by hand. But I don't want to wrap myself up in crunching these numbers and avoid looking at what they're telling me. So that's why this sample standard deviation formula is built into your calculator. Likewise, there's a formula for the sample standard deviation of y. Oh, I apologize. I didn't have the paper moved up. Sample standard deviation of y is the sum of all the y squared minus the sum of all the y's, then squared, divided by n, divided by n minus 1. What I want you to know is every problem that we calculate, we have formulas that go back to the basic data. So that's worth writing down. Each of these statistics, do you remember what a statistic was called? Why the course is called statistics? A statistic is a calculation about the values in a sample. and parameters. What was a parameter? A parameter is a calculation about the data in a complete population. A population. Each of these statistics and parameters can be computed, calculated, if you prefer,
from the basic data in our sample or population. Some of these formulas are already on your formula sheet and maybe I'll add a few more just to illustrate before we get into our last exam. But I want to tell you what the basic data is. Anytime someone gives you a set of data, well, maybe the very first basic data is how many pieces of data were you given, the N. The values from the set X or Y, those are basic data values. I could square each X or square each Y. You see that used in the standard deviation formula. So that must be a basic building block for this value of standard deviation. In other formulas, sometimes I multiply the values of X and Y. When we're talking about standard deviation or variance, I sometimes used the mean to examine the difference between any value and the average value for x or for y. And now in this chapter, we've added a new difference, the difference between the best fitting line in each of these data points. And the best fitting line is called y hat, I'll show you the A and B in a second. And the data points are the actual Y values. So I should be interested in the difference between the Y values and the values of that line. So that is kind of what I was aiming at. And we could talk about more values, but these are some basic trivia facts of the data we were given we can calculate any statistic from these data points. Now, the new things that we're gonna add today is reminding you how we calculated A and B. The y-intercept, make sure my paper is adjusted the y-intercept of the least squares regression line and the slope of the least squares regression line. And then there's a new statistic we wanna look at called the correlation. That tells us how good the line fits the data. And then we want to talk about another statistic called S, the standard deviation of the residuals. And so we'll define this for you today. So these are the new things that we're gonna talk about today, the new parameter statistics we're gonna talk about today. Okay. The residuals, remember, are the distance from the points to the line. At, remember, standard deviation talks about kind of like an average distance or a basic distance between. So how much spread is in these distances? Do you see some of these points barely miss the line? Some of these points are far off the line. What can I make out of that? That's called the standard deviation of the residuals and that has a special formula. Okay, before I go on and show you where I get some of these formulas, I wanna point out why I highlighted X mean and Y mean, 6.82 and 5.38. I want to point this out because this X is kind of like an anchor. It's kind of like pinning down the line before I wiggle it and try to find the best fitting line. It's kind of exciting that the X mean and Y mean, which may not be obviously related at all, they form the pivot point 
for the anchor of that line of best fit. Okay, so now before we go to the calculator and pull out all the information that I can, I'm just going to write down the formulas for this A and B in case you wanted to calculate them directly yourself. So if you wanted to calculate B directly yourself, you could use a variety of formulas, but here's a simple one based on these numbers. So the value of B, if you summed all the X, Y's from the data set, and then you summed all the X's from the data set, and you summed all the Y's from the data set. Remember, I'm using this capital letter Greek sigma just to represent add up all the X's, add up all the Y's, divide by N. And then you subtract that number and divide by a very similar number. Instead of X times Y, X times X. Subtract, instead of sum X times sum Y, you do sum X times sum X. That's sum X squared divided by N. This turns out to be exactly the slope of the best fitting line. Once you know the slope, you can find the y-intercept very quickly by taking the value of y average minus this b that you calculated times x average, y mean minus b x mean. And the reason for that is because the name of that line, that line has to go through the point x bar y bar. So that line y equals a plus bx. Uh, okay, I'm using a different colored pen. It's pink, it's a little bit hard to read. I apologize. Let me go to red. That line, the best fitting line y hat equals a plus bx. That has to contain the point, as we said, x bar, y bar. So if you put x bar on this side and y bar on this side, that gives you a formula for a. You can find a by just taking y bar minus b times x bar. So here's a fancy calculation, and then you can calculate the A very quickly. Okay, the R is messier. And you're not gonna calculate the R by hand. You really aren't. But in case you want to see the formula for it, I'll write it down because you can construct it from these numbers right here. You take the sum, of the x times y's, you subtract the sum of the x's times the sum of the y's over n. And then you divide by two pieces in the square root. And the first piece looks like this formula, replacing the y's with x's. So sum x squared minus sum x squared over n. And then the second piece looks like the same formula, replacing the x with a y. Sum y squared minus sum of y's squared over n. The reason I'm writing these formulas down for you is not because you're going to use them to construct these values, but I kind of want you to see the poetry in these formulas, how they're based on summing x squareds or summing x's and then squaring them or summing x, y's or summing x's and summing y's and then multiplying them. Everything is based in the end on the x values and the y values. 
Okay, one more number that I want to write down, although we're not going to calculate it with this formula. This is called the standard deviation of the residuals. And that formula would go like this. The author presents it as the standard, the squared sum of the errors. This is add up all the epsilons, all the errors squared and then divide by n minus two. And take the square root. Again, look at sum of somebody being squared. And whether I divide by n or n minus one or n minus two depends on the situation in the problem. Now there's all kinds of connections between these numbers. For example, B could also be calculated by taking R in terms of standard deviation and the Y data divided by the standard deviation of the X data. That's another formula for B. Or you could relate this R and S. But all of these things, you're not going to use these formulas for, you're going to calculate them in your calculator. I'm going to write this down. These are all calculated, built in to any standard calculator. Uh, when I say standard calculator, I don't mean the solar calculator that you find at Walgreens, you know, that just does add, subtract, multiply, divide. I mean, any basic school calculator. Or you could find these formulas in Excel, or you could find these formulas in Desmos. Many other places. Okay. So now let me take this to the calculator screen and show you where you're going to get these. So I already have my calculator screen set up over here and let me get this to you. Let me share this calculator screen with you. We can talk about it. Got it, go. We're sharing the calculator screen. Okay, very good. And I want to make that a little bit smaller. Make this a little bit smaller. Okay, very good. So you see in my screenshots on the right hand side that we've already put in this information last time. But I just want to review for you exactly how I put in the information. I won't re enter it, but I want to remind you of where I got the information to draw that line. So first of all, let's look at the list menu. Statistics, edit, these are my lists. And here I typed in years since 1998 and purchasing power parity from the problem. When we do another problem, we'll erase these and move to another problem. And then in order to draw these black dots on the screen, which represent these points, which I drew by hand on the paper, what I did was I went to the stat plot window and turned on plot number one and told it to do a scatter plot using the points X and Y and list one and list two. I can use dots to make the scatter plot. I could use plus signs or thick dots or tiny dots, my choice. I could color the dots differently. But when I did that, this is the graph that I get. These are just the dots that I've shown you so far. 
Now over on the right-hand side, you see that I've added that best fitting line. Where did I get that best fitting line? Who did the calculations for me? The calculator did these calculations. And in two places, last time we showed you that under calculate linear regression, a plus bx, the calculator will take the two lists and calculate the line that fits best. And even if I do variables, y variables, function variables, y1, it'll even put that line into the y equals menu for me. So when I calculate this, the calculator comes back, I'll write these numbers on the paper, and says a equals minus 0 0.8856, and b equals, when we come back to our paper, maybe we'll have a use for these numbers, 9192, using four decimal places just as a default level of accuracy. I can go and graph these now, because if I look in the y equals menu, that line, every single digit, is printed on Y1. I didn't have to write them down and remember them and then type them in. So now the graph contains the dots and the best fitting line. Awesome. Remember, I also have to go through the mean here, but I haven't actually calculated the mean. The mean was 6.82 and 5.38. So let's trace on this line. Oh, 6.82 and 5.38. Well, that's as close as I'm going to get here in this trace. So that is kind of like the center of the line. In some ways, possibly the center of the data. OK. But there was another place where I could calculate that line. Under stats, tests, linear regression t-test. So now we're going to go through this screen, go through all the data on this screen, and then perform a hypothesis test to judge how well that line could represent a whole population of data. So if you try linear regression t-test, calculator is set up to read your data points and perform the test. And I'm going to give it the same list one and list two. OK, that's good. Frequency one. I didn't have a frequency list. We're going to explain in a second what row not equal to zero means. Right now, this thing that looks like a wavy P is a Greek letter. It's a lowercase Greek letter called rho. It's in English, you would write R-H-O, and you pronounce that rho. So what is rho, and what do you do with it? That's what we're going to investigate today. It's a hypothesis test. We're going to still store the equation in R1, but when we calculate, we don't just get the A and B, we get a whole screen full of data. Here we go. The A and B are shown here. These are the same A and B that I calculated a second ago. But on top of that, and let me go down, I get these other things that I wrote on the paper. The S, the standard deviation of the residuals. So let me write that on a paper in case we come back to it. 1.8838. And the R is the correlation coefficient. And this screen tells me the correlation coefficient is 0.8799. Uh, there's one more famous coefficient that's called R squared right there. R squared, the calculator tells me, is 0 0.7742. And R squared is exactly as it promises. All you do is square R, you get this R squared right here. If you square 0 0.877 or 0 0.8799 squared, you'll get 0 0.7742 approximately. This R squared has its own name since it's important. The R is called the correlation coefficient. The R squared is called 
the determination coefficient. And I'll explain what the determination coefficient means, or does for us later. So I'm just calculating all this information. Well, I'm writing down the information the calculator did for me. The degrees of freedom is nine. And the degrees of freedom in this problem is what? N minus two. So that's another statistic that I want to keep track of. N minus two in this problem, it's nine because I had 11 records. And let's think about this. When do you talk about degrees of freedom? You talk about degrees of freedom principally when you're gonna do a t-test, when you're gonna use the t-distribution. So if I go up the screen, notice above the degrees of freedom, it says t value, 5.5557. So somebody performed a t-test. Well, the calculator performed a t-test, a test on a t-distribution. And when you perform a hypothesis test, you get a probability value. Here's the probability value the calculator reported. So we're gonna write this down too, in case I come back to the paper. And then I'll show you what test the calculator performed and what was the value of that test? That's a high T value, you know, five standard deviations away from the center, five and a half. That's relatively large. That explains that small P value. Or remember how the test statistic? is related to the P value. The calculator just says P because it doesn't want to use up space. P value here is 0 0.0003, tiny. That's what that E to the minus four, the times 10 to the minus four represents. Three, five, <coughs> excuse me, three, five, three, eight. Okay, so that's a tiny P value. Now, if I remember what P values are worth, right? If a p-value is smaller than the level of significance, I'm going to reject the null hypothesis. So somebody is performing a hypothesis test here. We just have to figure out what hypothesis test. So on the positive side, you see the calculator is collecting all of these statistics for us. So let's go back to our graph and start to consume the statistics. Okay, we already put the X bar and Y bar in here and that goes through the center of the line. The R we said last time was a measurement. Let's go, I'm gonna go back to my paper just for a second, but we'll keep the screen around in case we need it later. It's kind of nice in this computer program for the calculator that I could show you more than one screen at once. Sometimes that's handy. Okay, back to the paper. So we know the line of best fit. We know the X bar, we know the Y bar. We know the R value is 0.8799. Last time we said that if the R is close to one, That indicates a strong connection, a strong correlation between the X values and the Y values. And this R is close to one. Now the question in your mind then is like, well, what does it mean to be close to one? How close to one? So you have an idea of what it means to be close to one, how close to one, we'll have to examine that. Uh, remember that our line could have positive slope or negative slope. If the R is positive, it means that your line has got a positive slope. So close to one means positive slope and close to the data points. A negative R 
That's why I use the absolute values here. A negative R, absolute value just takes a negative 0.7 maybe and makes it 0.7. Absolute value of negative number close to one means also there's a strong correlation, but if R is negative, that means the slope of this line is negative, decreasing as you increase the independent variable, okay? So that's the purpose of the R. Now let's talk about the determination coefficient and the degrees of freedom in the test that I'm computing. I don't have a good example in this example, it'll be a better example next time. But the idea is, this is just a small sample of data about this country. What if I took many, many more data points about Cuba's purchasing power parity? Instead of taking it every year, what would happen if I took that data every quarter? You know, lots of financial records are calculated quarterly. What would happen if I took that data every month? Some financial records, such as your bank account or your credit card balance, those are computed monthly. I could take the data every single day, although that might be overkill in this case because I'd have a hard time distinguishing between daily variations and really important variations. So the sample we have talks about how strong the correlation is in the sample. But what if I want to test for how strong the correlation is in an entire population? Have you noticed something throughout the semester? When we talk about sample, we use ordinary A, B, C, D, E, F, G, like X bar, Y bar, S for standard deviation. When we talk about a population, we commonly use Greek letters, mu for mean, sigma for standard deviation. So it is for correlation. When we talk about correlation in the whole population, we're talking about rho. This is the funny kind of curvy P. You can just do it by doing the kind of like a spiral outwards. This is the Greek letter rho, and it stands for the correlation in the whole population. So if the rho is close to one, then also the correlation in the population is very strong. If the value of R is close to zero, that means that there's a very weak correlation or maybe even no correlation if R was actually equal to zero. And likewise, for the population, if the row was zero or close to zero, that means that over the whole population, I don't expect that there's any usable relationship between these two data sets, X and Y. But what's our problem? We can't examine the whole population. To examine the whole population might be a horrible amount of data collection. It might be expensive. It might take a very, very long time. So what are we gonna do? We're gonna perform a hypothesis test to see if rho is close to zero within a certain error bound. We want to know, what we call this is the significance of the correlation coefficient. We want to know how good is that R? Does that R tell me that there's actually a relationship I can exploit in the population? So let me slide this down. There's two papers at once for a second. This is called the hypothesis test. For the significance of our correlation coefficient R.
And this is a T test. It is two-tailed. And our hypothesis are that in our whole population, there is no correlation at all. Rho is equal to zero. But our alternative, our alternative hypothesis is that no, I have discovered a relationship between X and Y in this population. The rho is not zero. Now, if the rho is equal to zero, then in a way we're saying this R is not very strong. So we say that in English by saying, or in statistics by saying, R is not significant. There's not a significant correlation between the two data sets. But if the row is not zero, that means there is a best fitting line that I can use to make good predictions about the population. In that case, we say R is significant. So I'm just giving you some vocabulary here. This test is almost always performed. At the 5% level of significance. So we can sometimes choose different levels of significance to do different jobs. This test here is always performed at the 5% level of significance. I, I should be careful when I say always, 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 but most likely you're going to see this at the 5% level of significance. If the problem doesn't say anything, you can assume the 5%. So the test statistic that we're going to use right here, and again, the calculator does this for us, but we want to know how to do this ourselves. This t-test, the test statistic is r times the square root of n minus 2 divided by 1 minus r squared. And we can calculate that because we already know what r is from the calculator or from our fancy formula that I don't insist to use. So in this case, when the calculator screen told us that the t was 5.5557. That was the test statistic. Now remember what a t distribution looks like, kind of like a standard normal distribution, but shorter and wider. Shorter and wider, but not that wide. I mean, yeah, okay, everything can go out left and right forever. So this is T distribution. A little bit shorter than a standard normal distribution, a little bit wider. I'm not claiming that this is a good drawing. I'll have the calculator draw it in a second, right? But this is a T distribution. And remember, I have to describe the degrees of freedom in this problem 11 minus 2. N minus 2 is how we calculate the degrees of freedom. So here the degrees of freedom is nine. So this is the T distribution with nine degrees of freedom. This is the center, one, two, three, four, five. You see how this is gonna get out of control. Five standard deviations, well, not out of control. I just mean this area here is extraordinarily tiny. And that area is called the p-value. And the calculator did this p-value for us. It calculated it to be, I got to remember what I saw on the screen. I'll go back and share the screen with you for a second. 3.538 times 10 to the minus 4. So that was 0 0.000. .00. 
three, eight. That P value is less than 0 0.05. This is our alpha. So this is our standard response. This P value, this probability is so tiny that the idea that these points just randomly line up is essentially impossible, just ridiculous. Way, way, you know, what percent? That's three one hundredths. That's less than four one hundredths of one percent. Odds you would never bet on in a game or at Vegas, right? So the idea that these points lining up as an accident is ridiculous. We're gonna reject H naught. What was H naught? That rho was zero. That there's no connection between these X and Y values in the entire population. So we are going to say there is significant evidence. that rho is not zero, that there is a relationship in the general population. There is a relationship if we collected a lot more data about Cuba's purchasing power parity, or you could say it this way, that R is significant. Now be careful when I say that the difference between rho and r, r is significant and rho is different than zero. This line right here says, there's a strong correlation between these data points and this regression line. If I collected a lot more data about the Cuban purchasing power parity, you know, I might get a slightly different line. Again, we might get more information. So the correlation of this line to the data is not necessarily the same as the correlation of the line that best fits the entire population data. So R and rho are different things. They measure different things. So make sure that you keep the distinction between the two of them. Okay, good. So this was a very quick rundown, and even that took too long, of the last of that example from the previous time. So what I want to do is do a whole new example with you and run through these things effectively here. Uh, on the calculator screen, I guess I could share the calculator screen with you. I could do this T graph. The calculator won't do this for the linear regression test, but if you want to do a distribution, Y equals, and then put in the T distribution here of degree nine, second function, distribution, T probability distribution function, value x, degrees of freedom nine. So you can see how tiny that area is. That's absolutely fine. But you're gonna have to turn off these other graphs. You're gonna have to reposition yourself because the T distribution will not be drawn the same place that the dots are drawn. So I'm gonna do window and I'll graph that T distribution for you, but see it's not in the right window here. So let's say zoom, stat, that's not gonna help me. Let's do a zoom window, sorry, quit. Look at the window and say something like uh, minus seven, no, not minus seven. I gotta learn to say negative seven seven okay negative seven to seven 
and 0 0.1, negative 0 0.1. I just want to show you this T distribution to 0 0.4, counting by 0 0.1s. So there's a T distribution, almost like standard, standard normal distribution, but much wider, shorter at the top. And you count one, two, three, four, five. Here's five units over to the right. The area under this curve is tiny, tiny, tiny. So this easily beats smaller than area of 5%. Okay, let's get out of there. And let's look at this problem that I promised. And sorry, I'll bring my paper down. I'll number this sheet of paper. Let's quickly go through 12.5 number 68. I can get this out or I can read this to you. It's got a very small table right here. It says, we want to compute a relationship between year of birth and life expectancy. So I'm going to write this down really quickly. Year of birth and life expectancy. And this is for individuals born in the United States. in these years. And it lists one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine years. So that's not gonna be terrible for me to write down. Let's say 1930, 1940, 1950. I'm gonna change this table in a second. I'm just scratching down these numbers here. I gotta get it closer so I can read it with my eyes. 1965, uh, 1973. Sometimes you hear this reported on news, life expectancy of a person in the United States is blank. Uh, most recently you've heard it reported on the news because the life expectancy in the US has declined in the last few years. Life expectancy goes up when people's lives, I don't wanna say are easier, but you know, less troubled by disease or poverty or such. But then it can go the other way. If you're too comfortable, if you develop some unhealthy habits, like you're slightly overweight, I, I would say I have some unhealthy habits. I'm probably slightly overweight. Uh, you have, could have other unhealthy habits that were more common in the past. And the most famous one might be smoking. Uh, smoking nowadays is much less than smoking was probably in the 50s or 60s. Seventy-eight point seven. So let's take this data, year of birth and life expectancy, and let's look for a connection. Before I do that, I'm going to change this to year of birth And I don't want to deal with these large numbers. How about just since 1900? That's going to make the numbers large enough. 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, all the way up to 110 years since 1900. So let me redraw this table more neatly. 30, 40, 50. This is what I'm going to enter into my calculator. The only reason I'm doing this, as long as you write it down that you're doing it, it's OK. But the only reason I'm doing this is so I don't have to type in lots of large numbers to my calculator. And life expectancy, US life expectancy, I don't have to really adjust those numbers. They're about ordinary size. So I'll just write those carefully, 59.7. I was trying to write these so that you could easily read which one belonged to which one. 62.9, 70.2. Then let's go and stick those right away into the calculator. 
75, 75.7, and 78.9. Before I stick them in the calculator, I'll do a quick and dirty graph right here. By a quick and dirty graph, I just mean I want to see where these points are roughly so that when my calculator shows me the points, I know how to judge whether I made a mistake or not. So let's count years since 1900. But if you are writing this down for someone, like you're going to hand in a paper, well, it's nice to make a good graph here and to label it properly. So my finished product would have all these things marked carefully. So there's years since 1900, I counted by 30s so that I didn't have to write a lot of numbers. And then what do I got here? It's from 59 to 78. I can start this graph anywhere I want to, right? So why don't we start it at 50 and then make this 60. As long as I'm consistent and tell people what my scale is, I can start the graph at any reasonable place. Life expectancy 100. Well, I don't think we're heading in that direction. Okay, now let's make the dots on the paper very roughly, 30 and 59.7. I don't know exactly where 59.7 is, but it's darn close to 60. That's a fair dot. And now I do 40 and 62.9. 50 and 70.2, a little bit over 70. Then I get into strange numbers, 65 and 69.7, you know, midway numbers. I'm just judging by 73, who gave me that? And 71, oh, did I do 69.7 badly? That number is an error. Here's 65 and 69.7. See, this is the problem with doing things in pen. 73 and 71. 82 and 74. 75 exactly at 87. 92 and 75.7, 110 years after 1900, I'm at 78.9. Okay, I got one bad point there. I marked it out with an X. But what do I see? I see what I expect to be. It looks like a linear relationship. I'm nervous about this one right here. That looks way out of place. Let me look that one up. 50 and 70.2. That's where it should be. So that could be a potential outlier. Now let's go to the calculator and just do this work. Talk about potential outliers. So I'm going to share a screen with you. I'm going to go back to my calculator. I'm going to get rid of this graph. And I'm going to go to my stat lists. Remember, I can clear these individually, but I want to give you a demonstration again of how I clear the list with one stroke. And that's under stats, clear list. And now I can clear list L1 or clear list L1 and L2 by separating with a comma. Calculator dutifully says I'm done. And now I can just enter these numbers. So 30, 40, 50, 65, 73, 82, that was 1982, 87, 92, and 110, 2010. Okay, good. So that's nine data values. That makes sense. Now let's go here and say 59.7. These numbers are a little more irregular. And then 62.9. 70.2, you can enter numbers faster if someone's reading them to you. You 
can also enter numbers faster if you don't speak them. Although you get a little more safety if you speak them, 74.5, 75, 75.7. Always double check what you enter, 78.9. Okay, good. So we got our points in here. Let's go create a stat plot like I have in the upper right hand corner, but I'm going to change it now. So plot one, turn it on, make it a scatter plot. Use list L1 and L2. Why don't we use plus signs here today just for variation? Why don't we use blue just to give you some variety? Where's blue? There, finally. Okay, and let's graph it. I got a couple problems here. I got that T distribution and I got no dots. So I should go back and turn off that T distribution. I'm gonna eliminate this line because it's certainly not the best fitting line for this problem. And I'm gonna go under zoom and say zoom stat. That will give me a window that has these points nicely spaced. Okay, very good. The points are nicely spaced and they look like what we did. It looks like a lot of gray lines here, right? So I think what I should do is go to window and say, let's count by tens. Let's count the years by tens, not every single year. And let's count the Y scale by also tens. Okay, that'll make this easier to read. There we go. That is, must be 60, 70, and 80. I could go to the window and find out. Yeah, it starts at 56, so 60, 70, and 80. So I could go every five years. That makes you feel better. Sometimes it's better to have more graph lines. So 55, no, sorry, 60, 65, 70, 75, 80. And then here are years since 1900, starting at year 22. I'm counting by tens. So this will be 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100, 110. Okay, so now I think I did these points nicely. Uh, you can use a calculator screen to present your homework. I have no problem with that. But uh, you should label these lines after you put them into your paper. You could take a screenshot of your calculator, you could blow it up, fit it to your paper, but then you could write down what each of these lines means in value. Don't forget to do that. Now let's go to our stats test and do the linear regression t-test and just collect our information. L1, L2, let's test row to see if it's near zero essentially or it's different from zero. Let's put the line, the regression line, the best fitting line in Y1, and let's calculate. Here's all the data that I'm going to write on my paper. So the A and the B, what else? The degrees of freedom. Well, I had, a, I had nine records. I knew the degrees of freedom was seven. Uh, the R, the R squared, and the S. I haven't told you the value of S yet, but we'll get that in there. So A is 54.89. And B is, I'm rounding off, 0 0.2290. That's a slope. For every year since 1990, we gained almost a quarter of a year in life expectancy. So that's the change in Y every time a year goes by, one unit goes by in X. The R is 0.9625. That is very close to one. That makes sense because these dots seem to be much more tightly lined up than our Cuba example. R squared is 9.6. The determination coefficient, I'll tell you what that is briefly. And then finally, this S was 1.8, zero, 
one. Okay, that's a standard deviation. 1.80, I could say 0, 0, 0, 0.08, 1. 1.801. Okay, so let's see that line. Let's see that line graphed. So I got the line right here. Let's graph it with my data. Let's update my screen too, by the way, so I get rid of that previous line. Yeah, that line fits those points pretty nicely. Now this point right here looks a little bit out of place, but what do I mean by out of place? Out of place means more than two standard deviations away from the line. And that's where this 1.8 comes in. Two times 1.8 is about 3.6. Now let's draw this line on my paper, just in case we have to come back to my paper. I'm gonna come back here. I'm gonna come back here through that point. Got it. That line looks about like that. And let me go back to my paper so you can see that I did a fair job of drawing it. Where does it cross? Oh, more than 50, less than 55. Maybe that's about 54. The slope is 0 0.2290. So every time I go over one, I go up 0 0.2290. And every one of these points looks good. Like it fits the line very tightly. Maybe this point doesn't look like it fits the line very tightly, but how do I decide whether it's too far away or not? I look at the standard deviation of the residuals. So a potential outlier Let me raise this paper up, and this is pretty much the last thing I'm going to do here. A potential outlier is a point that is plus or minus two standard deviations of the residuals away from our linear regression line. Now, how am I going to decide that with my paper? Is this more than 3.6 away? It certainly looks like it, but it'd be much easier to do this visually on our calculator screen. Let's go back to calculator screen. And remember my variables list, statistics variables, test variables. Where well, I'm looking for the S, there's the S under test variables. That number is stored in the calculator. So I don't have to type it in. I can go to the Y equals menu and tell the calculator to draw a line Y1. That's a Y variables function, Y1, plus two S's. Sorry, I got to redo it. In a hurry, it's a bad plan. Plus two let's go get the variables statistics variables test variables and where was that s there it was it's zero and then i'll do the same thing y1 minus 2s and then the calculator will draw an error band around my best fitting line plus and minus 2s y variables function y1 minus two times variables, statistic variables, test variables, S. This is beautiful. Now, what I'm gonna do is my line was red, right? So let's make these lines different. Let's make them black. Okay, I'm okay with black line, but let's make it a thin line. Got it. Let's make this blue thing black. Where is black? Finally, and let's make it a thin line. Right now it's a thick line, now it's a thin line. Okay, go. And now let's go. And now let's graph again. The calculator does a little plus minus 2s for me. Now that blue dot is outside that black line. If you want to zoom in, I think you could zoom in. It's an outlier. It is a potential outlier. I might want to ask questions about that dot. Was it a mistake? 
but it's just barely an outlier. So I'm not gonna like totally throw it out. If you have an error in your data, you could get rid of that data point, but I don't see a reason necessarily to get rid of that data point. Maybe there's a reason that people made this big jump in life expectancy from 1940 to 1950. Let's think about this, 1940, life expectancy, World War II. Now, not a lot of Americans died in World War II, but some died, and that probably held down the life expectancy. 1930s, just coming out of the Great Depression. So 1950, you're done with the Great Depression, you're done with World War I, maybe. That's why the life expectancy jumped. Be careful when you do that, inventing explanations for numbers. You don't really know everything that's behind these. I'm going to go back to my stats menu to say one more thing before we quit. Let's talk about our linear regression t-test. So our t-value is very high, point, or 9.387. Our probability is very low. That means this line is a very it seems like a very good fit. It's not due to randomness. Let's look at our R, 0.96, very strong correlation. The R squared is the correlation, uh, is the determination coefficient. Determination co coefficient in English, you can read the expression in the book, but determination coefficient in English says how much error is explained but best fitting line and how much error is unaccounted for. So when you have R squared very close to one, you're saying that the difference in these points to the line is very small, that the error here is probably due to the variation in data collection from the line and not due to other errors. It's called the determination coefficient. So I think this line is very good predictor. Our row should not be zero. If we collected more data about life expectancy, like life expectancy in 1946, I think this line would be a good predictor, right? And we can get the life expectancy in 1946. So by saying calculate, calculate, value, 1946, remember that's 46 years after 1900. There, life expectancy in 1946 should be about 65 years, 65.4 years. That would be at least a fair estimate of life expectancy. What about life expectancy in the year 2000? That would be 100 years. Life expectancy in the year 2000, 77.8. I think that is a good representation. Life expectancy was about that time around 78, 76, 78. A woman's life expectancy is slightly higher than a man's life expectancy on average, ordinarily. Okay, we got to cut it off there. So you've been very kind and patient. And I just want to show you the meaning of the numbers that your calculator spits out for you. I think I only want to say one thing, you know, use the calculator to do the numbers, use the calculator to check a graph, but when you make a graph, make that graph very neat and well labeled. I didn't finish labeling this, but my Cuban example, I did a better job labeling. Okay, I'm gonna hang it up right here so I can get this recording posted. Uh, you pick up your exam if you haven't done so yet. And then if you have any questions about that, please contact me and I'd be happy to go over it with you but I'm going to get these things recorded and uploaded. You guys have a nice weekend.